So basically, this is our last installment of the webinar series, um, our four-part series. So now we're coming to the end of a tenancy. So what happens um, if you want to leave, if the landlord wants you to leave, or, you know, God forbid, if there's evictions or notices to vacate there. So on today's agenda, these are some of the things we're going to be discussing. So lease breaking fees, compensations, um, bonds, how to get that back, as well as the process of leaving. Um, so again, the terminology stays the same as the changes as of the 29th of March. So today um, I'm going to be using the terminology on the right. So renter, rental provider, real estate agent, rooming house operator and rental agreement. Um, there's also your normal ones, which, you know, is BCAT, the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal, the RTBA, the Residential Tenancies Bond Authority. They're also um, broken down in the slides anyways, but those are some of the main um, legal jargon terms I'll be using today. So basically, we'll start off with what happens when the rental provider wants you to leave. So this can be for a number of reasons. They might want to move back in. They might want to renovate the property. But the one thing they can't do is evict you because you've tried to enforce your rights. So, well, basically enforce your rights in accordance with the Act. So if you try to issue the land or the landlord or the rental provider with a breach of duty notice because they failed to fix something that's hazardous or, um, you know, that you've tried to, um, ask them to fix something numerous times and they're like, oh, I don't want to fix it. So I'm just going to tell this person to leave and I'll find another tenant that's easier to deal with. Um, it's actually a punishable offence to do that, to try to intimidate, threaten or prevent someone from exercising their rights in accordance with the Act. Um, and you can't be blacklisted or put on a tenancy database because you tried to enforce your rights and the landlord evicted you for that purpose. Um, so basically, what is a notice to vacate? So if the landlord or the rental provider wants you to leave, what they need to do is um, start off by issuing you a notice to vacate. So this just means it's a letter from the rental provider saying that they want you to leave. And for it to be valid, it needs to include these things here. So it can only be given for a specific reason, which we'll go through on the next slide. It must be served properly and it must adhere to notice periods. Um, it needs to, it, it can't be given to you before the end of your fixed term lease, unless under certain circumstances, like, you know, there's been um, major damage completed to the property where it's now unsafe, or if you damage the property, um, and it can, it, the, there, and the notice to vacate the notice to vacate can be challenged as well. So if it is invalid because it doesn't meet these terms here, it can be challenged as not being valid. And then so you just continue on as per normal until the rental provider proves otherwise. Um, the rental provider cannot issue a notice to vacate against the renter for enforcing their rights. So that's what I was saying against on the other side. Uh, that's what I was saying in the previous slide. So um, if the rental provider goes to VCAT, for example, to get a, um, an order compelling the rental provider to fix the property, the rental provider can't evict them, um, you know, for starting a VCAT application that's well within their rights. So as long as the notice to vacate adheres to these um, details, it's potentially valid. Again, you can call us, check in with us if you're not too sure, because if it's not valid, it can basically be ignored. Um, this is some of the, these are some of the reasons as to why a notice to vacate may be issued. And so these are for people in fixed term leases. So if you haven't watched my first few slide, um, first few episodes, it may be worth going back because now some of these terms are kind of, I'm, uh, I'm assuming that you know these terms already, but a fixed term lease is basically if you're on a private lease, your um, agreement is a residential rental agreement, you're fixed into the lease until a certain amount of time. This is when um, these terms apply. So basically, if you, if there was a, if the rental provider issued you with a notice to vacate because there was serious damage caused to the property, then it will come into effect immediately, meaning you need to potentially leave immediately. Um, uh, one of the other reasons may be because um, the renter threatened or intimidated the um, real estate agent or the rental provider. So then if that's the case, then um, they could be issued with a 14 day notice, meaning that from the day that the notice is provided, um, at the end of that 14 day period, the rental provider may need to leave. 
Um, and I say may because I'll elaborate a little bit more later when we get to that nice diagram. Um, and so these are some of the reasons as to why the notice to vacates may be issued against the renter. Again, the, the rental provider can only give a notice to vacate for a reason specified in the Residential Tenancies Act. They can't give it to you because they don't like you or because you know, your personality doesn't flow with their pet's personality or something like that. Um, if you're on a periodic lease, meaning you're on a month by month lease under a residential rental agreement, these are some of the things that the rental provider may issue to you. You'll notice that the, um, the notice periods are longer, therefore giving you more time um, to potentially look for alternative accommodation. So if a fixed term agreement um, of less than six months is ending, then the rental provider can give you a notice to vacate with 60 days notice, um, therefore giving you, you know, two months to find another property before you have to potentially leave. Um, with the notice to vacate, if it's valid, these are again some of the things that you want to be looking out for. So is it using um, the proper form provided by, consu by Consumer Affairs Victoria? Um, is it addressed to you or is it addressed to someone else that's not even on the lease? If it's not addressed to you, then how can you respond to something that's not addressed to you? So um, that is a potential issue that you can um, use to invalidate the notice to vacate. Has it been signed and dated by the rental provider or the real estate agent? Um, does it clearly state the reason for the notice? And is there sufficient detail? Like they can't just say, oh, selling the property. Okay, you're selling the property. Has it been assigned to an agent? Um, you know, when is it going live on the market? Things like that. They need to provide sufficient detail. A valid reason under the Residential Tenancies Act. So is it something that's in accordance with the Act? So, you know, we know that um, it can be put on the market. So if they are selling the property, that is a reason that is allowed. Um, so property to be sold need to show proof. Um, and then basically, uh, what else do you need? You need to state the termination date. So basically on the form, it needs to say, this is the day that you need to leave by. It's not a day that you actually have to leave, but it needs to say, this is the day you need to leave by. And it needs to be in accordance with the dates that are allowed. So if it's with if, it, if the termination date is before the end of the notice period, then again, that's an invalid notice. Um, and then it needs to be accompanied by documentary evidence. So depending on what, um, I guess, what reason they're relying on, it's going to look different, um, the different kind of evidence they need to provide. So for example, one of the things may be that there's planned reconstruction or repairs of the property. Well, did they provide the contract um, with the building with the um, builders saying that they are they've signed up to repair the property or um, if they're going to be selling the property again do they have the proper proper documentation with the new real estate agent they've engaged for the sales campaign or you know if their family members are moving in do they have a stat deck or do they have um, some kind of proof to show that it is going to be a family member moving in? So if they're going to, whatever reason they rely on, there's um, a lot of the reasons now require evidence. It's not just a, a matter of saying, oh, my family's moving in. Well, anyone can move in. Um, they need to prove it. And then the last thing is um, service. So this is also very important. So um, the notice needs to be provided to you by either post or electronic communication. If it's by electronic communication, you know, for example, by email, that needs to have um, had prior consent. So electronic communication isn't automatic. Um, it needs to be consented to. Normally when you sign the lease, there's a little box saying, do you consent to electronic communication? If you didn't tick that box, then it needs to be provided to you via post. Um, and then Going into the next bit, what happens if you do get a notice to vacate and the termination day is um, quickly approaching? Do you need to leave? So essentially, the answer is no. There's a whole process that the rental provider must go through before they're allowed to legally evict you. A notice to vacate is just the starting, um, I guess, the, the starting point where they might indicate to you that they want you to leave. But it, until there is an um, a warrant, only the police can actually execute that and remove you from the property. The rental provider and um, the real estate agents do not have the right to remove you from the property or change locks without proper process. Um, so if that is the case or, you know, you're finding that that might be the, the, the way things um, play out, get in contact with us 
ASAP. So basically, once you get that notice to vacate, you wait for the termination date on the hearing. From there, you, you can basically still stay in the property because after the termination date, the rental provider would need to apply to go to VCAT. So if they apply to go to VCAT, then one of two things can happen. They will either be granted a possession order or refuse the possession order. If they're granted a possession or well, basically if they refuse the possession order or the order is dismissed for whatever reason, the renter can continue to stay at the property and then things go back to normal. If the possession order is granted, then it'll go to the next step, which is the um, warrant of possession. So then if the possession order is granted, then the rental provider basically needs to go buy a warrant. They need to pay for it. And then they need to book in with the police and say, here, I have a warrant. Can you please go into the property on this day and remove the renter? And so if you haven't left by then, then the police uh, may very well attend your property and say, hey, you need to move on now. There's an official legal order requiring you to leave the property. So that's basically the um, eviction process. And when I say eviction, it, it does sound um, a lot more heinous than what it actually is. It might just be, um, it might just very well be that, you know, that you need more time. And this is the kind of way that you go about potentially getting more time so you can find a property. Um, and then there's this new rule um, that applies again to rental, um, residential rental agreements, the five strikes rule. So this is basically for people in rent arrears. So previously before the 29th of March, if you were in a state of rent arrears, you owed more than 14 days worth of rent, then you could be issued with a notice to vacate. So now you can still be issued a notice to vacate, but you have five opportunities before it goes to a possession order or a VCAT stage. It will, as the way it works is it essentially goes first, second, third, fourth um, time you're in rental reason, you get a notice to vacate. If you pay the amount before it's due, uh, before the termination date, then basically that all goes away. And then um, you just continue renting as per normal. So that's perfectly fine. If you make the payment before the termination date, then the um, rental provider doesn't get to go to VCAT and apply for a possession order. So they don't get to go here. They basically stop at this point. Um, so then the it, for it to have effect, it's usually um, one of two reasons, either because you didn't pay the rent in time for the first, second, third or fourth notice. So if you didn't pay the arrears, then the rental provider can go apply at VCAT for a possession order, or if it's the fifth notice to vacate. If it's the fifth notice to vacate for the same reason within the 12 month period, then they can go get a possession order at VCAT. Um, before it even gets to this point, there's still the opportunity to negotiate a payment plan or um, be referred to a financial counselor to assist you organize you know, the, um, the payment plans and other financial matters. But once you're at that fifth notice within a 12 month period, all of that goes away. And basically the um, rental provider can go to VCAT and jump straight to that possession order process. Um, so then what happens if that, that's basically the sum of um, getting a notice to vacate when you have to leave, when you're obligated to leave um, and what kind of happens from there on. Um, but what happens if you want to leave? So basically, if you're at a point where you're done, your lease is over, you found another property or you decide to go overseas and, you know, study somewhere else or do something else. Basically, what you can do is issue the rental provider with something called a notice of intention to vacate. So this is very similar to a notice to vacate, but this is your version as a renter. So basically, it's a letter saying, um, telling the landlord or the rental provider that you want to leave. So this is what it looks like. It's a five page document. It's generally, you know, fairly straightforward. Your name, details, um, the termination dates so of the day that you actually want to leave. Um, and again, you know, you have minimum notice periods as well. So for the notice to be valid, it needs to be in writing, needs to include the date you want to leave, and it needs to be served in one of three ways. So similar to the way that the rental provider needs to serve it to you, you need to make sure you serve it to them properly as well. So either by registered post, by electronic um, means, so again, email, or by physically giving it to them by hand. Usually by registered post is the easiest way because you've got a tracking mechanism. Um, if you have, if you don't already have um, electronic communication agreements in place, um, it doesn't need to, it doesn't need to, 
be in this form specifically, it's definitely um, worth using this form because you're going to make sure that you're using, um, you're, you're putting in the correct details or you're putting in all the details that you need to. So these are the reasons why you can leave the property as a renter. Um, so basically these are the notice periods that you have to give. And these are some of the reasons as to why you can issue a notice of intention to vacate while you're, while you're in a fixed term lease. So basically, if the property doesn't meet minimum standards before the um, renter moves in, then basically you can just issue a notice of intention to vacate, say, no, nah, don't want to live here at all. Give me back the keys. I'm out. Um, that's perfectly fine. Um, again, you've got your basic you know, um, protections if the property is unsafe, um, if, the, if you've issued the rental provider with a breach of duty notice twice before four on the third time you can issue them with a notice to vacate notice of intention to vacate and just basically say nope I've given you plenty of chances third time you know I'm not taking this anymore I'm leaving um I'll give you back the keys in 14 days see you later so that's perfectly fine as well um if you're ending a fixed term agreement so before the end of your fixed term, say you're on a 12 month lease, you're coming up to um, you know, 11 months and you're like, oh, I don't wanna live here anymore. I feel like I'm gonna go back home, live with mum and dad or whatever the reason may be. You can issue a notice of intention to vacate. The minimum notice period is 14 days, but you can always, that's just minimum. You can always give them more notice. That's not a problem. So at that 11th month mark, you can say, hey, next month when my lease ends on this day, um, I'm giving you my notice of intention to vacate, giving you more than 14 days notice. I'll see you, you know, later. This is the day I'm leaving and see you later. So that's basically what you can do. Um, if the landlord or the rental provider gives you a notice to vacate for any of these reasons, you know, demolition, they're going to use the property as a business, um, one of their family members are moving in, they're selling the property, um, well, then basically you can, you have the right to give them a 14 days notice of intention to vacate and leave earlier um, if, you know, they've given you two, three months notice or whatever it is. Um, with ending a lease while you're in a rooming house, it's slightly different. It's not as onerous. So before we're talking about rental agreements, this is residency agreements. Again, they're very, very similar and it annoys me the wording, but it is what it is. So residency agreements are for rooming houses. So again, a rooming house is a property that can house up to four or more people. It doesn't have to have four bedrooms. It just needs to be able to house more than four people in accordance with the definition under section three of the Residential Tenancies Act. So if you're in a rooming house, basically if you're in a fixed term lease, so you're locked into a, a you know, three, six, 12 month lease, you need to give 14 days notice to say that you want to leave. If you're in a periodic lease, so a month by month lease, you just need to give two days notice and be out of there. Again, needs to be in writing, needs to basically adhere to these um, standards here. You can use this form, send an email, but normally, again, we'll recommend this form. Um, basically, if you're ending a lease while you're in a rental agreement, so again, we're going back to um, the rental agreement. So if you're in a co-tenancy a, a co in a private rental with just you and your partner, and you're all on the lease or, um, you know, subletting situation, those all fall under rental agreements. If you're in a fixed term, Basically, the best way to go about it, if you can't issue a notice of intention to vacate to break a lease, is to either um, negotiate a mutual agreement to end the lease. That's where you can negotiate whether there's any lease breaking fees or if there's any um, or if there's uh, any terms that you want to put into it. Um, you know, you know, there's a crack on the wall and you don't want to pay for it. So then you um, negotiate with the rental provider that, hey, I'll pay for a professional cleaner instead. And I'll pay, you know, to get the carpets cleaned, but I don't want to pay for that wall. And they're like, okay, sure, that's fine. That's not a problem. That's a negotiation um, ending your lease by mutual agreement. Um, with a VCAT application, you can also issue, um, you can also apply to VCAT um, because you're suffering severe hardship and ask for a reduction of your fixed term. So with COVID, this has happened quite a few times. Um, you know, people are facing financial hardship and if they were to stay in their lease, they'll just end up in more and more debt. Um, and if they leave, they'll be paying lease breaking fees, which they don't have money for. So what they can do is go to VCAT, ask the member to reduce the fixed term. So if they're in a 12 month lease, they're halfway through it, they can ask for the member to reduce it right down so the lease ends that day or they can, you know, ask for the lease to be halved so they've only got another three months left, something like that. 
Um, with an assignment, we spoke about this in the first episode. So um, if you didn't watch it, it's just basically saying, hey, I'm leaving this property. Um, I have a friend that wants to jump on the lease and take over though. Is that fine? And then you just sign the paperwork with the agent or the rental provider and be on your way. Um, and the last way to try to end your lease on a fixed term agreement is by issuing a notice of intention to vacate. But while you're in a fixed term lease, these notice of intentions to vacate usually incur lease breaking fees. So it's I say this quite loosely because you can't technically issue a notice of intention to vacate while you're in a fixed term. We're just utilizing this form basically as a guide. So you're complying with all of your requirements to leave. So this is just to prevent issues from happening. This is saying, I'm leaving, this is a day, all your particulars are there, but essentially you're still looking at lease breaking fees because you're locked into a contract and you're leaving early. So then um, the rental provider is potentially out of pocket because of your choices. Hence why the lease breaking fees. These aren't the only options you have to leave, but these are the main options you can utilize to try to leave the property while you're in a fixed term. So just to kind of go back a little bit, if we look at reasons when you want to leave, notice of intention to vacate, when you can give a notice to vacate. Um, and so some of these will be for fixed term, prior to ending fixed term agreements, some of these will be for when you're on a periodic lease. Um, so that's why these days are there but with a notice of intention to vacate while you're in a fixed term lease, these will be the options here as to how you would try to end your lease. you will still be by issuing a notice of intention to vacate, but these three options are um, secondary options as well you could use. Um, with the process of ending a lease, step one would be look at some of the methods available to you. So here, um, here, if you're in a rooming house or here, if you're in potentially a fixed term lease or on a periodic lease, depending again on what reason why you're wanting to leave. Um, so those would be the three pages you would refer to as to what you would be using as a reason for you to be able to leave. Um, and then you'd negotiate some of these things with the rental provider, regardless of what your option is. Um, talk to them about um, what lease breaking fees are applicable if they're applicable, um, the date that you want to leave and the day that you're going to return the keys. They're two very different things um, and the, any outstanding rental amounts that need to be paid. I'm sorry, I just got a message. Give me a sec. What if the renter wants to leave fixed term is in a share house and the lease agreements renter cannot find a replacement, cannot afford it. Okay, I think I'll talk to you about that, Catherine, a little bit more at the end because we can kind of pull that apart a little bit more. Um, but basically, step one, go through those things. Step two, then provide it in, in writing. Get both parties to sign it to say that, yep, we've negotiated these terms. Now we're putting it in writing um, and I'm giving you my notice. Um, sorry, I skipped the reason why date leaving and date keys are different. So the day you leave, you may still be holding on to the keys because if the real estate agent or the rental provider says, oh, you need to go back and clean something because it's not up to standard, standard, or um, you, know, you need to go back and fix something that you've damaged. If you hold on to the keys, even though you've moved out of the property, you still have possession of the property because you can go in and out whenever you want. That could potentially mean that you are still paying rent for every day you're holding on to the keys. That's why those two dates are very important. Negotiate those terms with the rental provider or the real estate agent. So basically, if they're asking you to go back and fix something and you've returned the keys the day that you're leaving and they want you to pick up the keys and go fix something again, ask them, am I paying rent for that period? Um, and then you can negotiate that with them, whether it's a yes or no. I don't know. I hope it's a no because I don't hope that you're paying more rent after you leave. But, you know, for every day you've got access to the property, that's every day they that's an additional day. They can't find another person to move into the property. So that's that premise. Um, so basically, once you've negotiated the terms, um, put it in writing. The third step is to clean the property. So you have duties as well. Make sure you clean the property, remove it, um, remove all your goods. Um, now with the new agreements after the 29th of March, in some instances, you may be required to hire a professional cleaner. Before that, it wasn't. Um, and then, uh, so Guan, you just put in a comment. So if you return the keys, are you not liable for further issues? that may arise as the 
rental provider has accepted the conditions? Not necessarily. So the rental provider um, still has the option to pursue you. So through the through your bond um, for any problems they find at the property if they choose to do an inspection. They have limited time requirements, which I'll go through in the bond section, um, but it's not true that once you return the keys, you're not liable anymore. Um, once they find someone else to move into the property, that's a bit of a different matter, um, but I'll talk more about that in the bond section. Um, so going back to step three, take heaps of pictures of the state of the property before you return the keys. I've had so many cases where there's been so many issues, people return the keys um, and then they're like, oh, but I forgot to take photos. That's your evidence. That's the um, information you're going to be relying on um, if the rental provider comes back and says, oh, but you damaged the property. Well, no, I didn't because when I left, the, the property was perfectly fine. It's not my fault after, you know, I left the property, you hired a cleaner and they damaged it. That's not my fault. But if you don't have those photos and they raise something after you left and you return the keys, so Guan Yu, a little bit to your question, you know, if they, if someone else goes in and damages it, how are you going to prove that it's not your, that it wasn't you? It's your word against theirs. Um, it's a bit of a different matter as to who's responsible for proving the damage, but you want to make sure you're protecting yourself by having those photos. Um, and especially you, we see it all the time where rental providers will say, oh, but it's still filthy. And you've hired cleaners like three times. And it's like, well, your standard of filth is different to mine. The only requirement you have when you're returning the property is to make sure it's in a clean state um, a reasonably clean state, I should say. Um, so basically the condition that you got the property in is a condition you want to return the property in, save for fair wear and tear. I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but with step four, return the key to the rental provider or the real estate agent. Um, step five, do an exit condition report with the rental provider. This is the stage where a lot of people have problems. Rental provider will come back and say, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. Um, just because they say it doesn't mean it's true. Um, it, it, it depends basically on your obligations or not. I would check in with um, one of the lawyers at Tenants Vic or um, at Study Melbourne if you're not sure, um, because a lot of the times you'll find that you didn't actually need to pay um, the rental provider the money they were asking. Um, step six, so organize for your bond to be returned with the rental provider. So basically once you go through all this, you're on your way out the door. We've got a little person here on the way out um, saying goodbye to the rental property. So um, lease breaking fees. We've got two sections left. I know that we're at 30 minutes. So I, oh, almost at 30 minutes. So if you need to go, you need to go. These sessions are recorded anyways. Um, but I hope that um, you can stay for the next two sections. I'll be really quick. So lease breaking fees, what you have to pay and um, you're getting your bond back are the next two bits. So basically, if you're breaking your lease, so again, this is a residential rental agreement. So co-tenancies, um, share houses, those kind of properties, then there's two things that can happen. If you're in your first fixed term period, your first fixed term period, meaning um, this is the first 12 months or six months or three months agreement, you've been in the property and you've never renewed it, and you leave before the end of the fixed term period, the fees that you might need to pay are reletting fees on a pro rata basis, adv advertising fees on a pro rata basis, and the remaining amount of rent. Um, and then how that's calculated is basically in one of two ways, either from the day you leave until the day a new renter is found, or from the day that you leave until the end of your first fixed term period. So if you've left, um, you know, at the six month mark, but then the renter, the rental provider finds a new person to move in in a month's time, you're only paying for the remaining rent for a month. They don't get to double dip and get you get you to pay for six months plus get a new tenant in and pay for their rent as well. That's not how it works. So whatever's the lesser of the two. Um, with reletting and advertising fees, again, this is only applicable if you're in your first fixed term lease. Um, and so with the pro rata basis, what that just means is essentially get the receipt of the amount that the rental provider paid to the real estate agent for those two fees. Um, divide that by 12 and then... Um, figure out how much is left with the amount of months that you have left in your lease. And that's usually how much you would pay, or if not until the end of your lease, until a new um, renter is found. I've got a formula on the next page, if that makes sense. But basically the reason why the remaining rent, the rental provider can't just ask you for it is because there's this rule here, the mitigation of loss rule. So, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, what's stopping the rental provider from just not 
finding a new renter. Well, if they're going to ask for compensation from you, they need to prove that they did everything within their power to mitigate their loss. So to reduce the loss or the damage that incurred, that they incurred because you left. And if there's been heaps of interest in the property and they said no, and then, you know, they didn't get the money that could have come in, well, then that's not your fault as a renter. That's their fault as a rental provider. And so they failed to mitigate loss. That will be taken into consideration. And then the amount that they're asking for will be reduced reduced in accordance with what was actually fair. Um, if you're past your first fixed term lease and you've signed a second lease or you're just on a periodic month by month, then the only thing you need to pay if you're leaving the property is the remaining rent up until the end of that fixed term period. So with a periodic, you just need to give 28 days notice and you're out anyways. But with a fixed term period on a, on a second lease, you just need to pay whatever's remaining or uh, up until the end of that term or until a new rental provider is found. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, with a residency agreement, so a rooming house type situation, if the this is a little bit different. So if the renter or the well technically residents um, in a rental in a rooming house, they're known as residents, not renters. Um, so if a resident leaves without giving notice to the rooming house operator, so the same equivalence um, to a rental provider, um, it's, an, it's a punishable offence of up to 25 penalty units. So per penalty unit is $165.22 in 2021. It consistently changes, but that's the rate at the moment. So you could be penalised um, a, a monetary sum for not providing a notice of intention to vacate. Um, and then it doesn't apply though if the rental provider is leave uh, if the resident is leaving because the property is unsafe or unfit for human habitation. When I say unfit for human habitation, it's quite a high threshold. Um, you know, we've had a matter where there was a gas leak at the property and it dunk the whole house up. It did not matter. That was, um, it's, it was still not deemed unfit for human habitation. So it's a very, very, very high threshold. Um, but basically with the rent, with the resident, if um, they don't, if they do want to leave, um, these are the ways they can do it. So they normally just have to either pay 14 days worth of rent if they're still in a fixed term um, or until they find another person to take over the occupancy of that room, whatever's the lesser of the amounts. If you're in a periodic um, lease and you're just on a month by month, you just need to pay two days of rent um, and then, or basically 48 hours notice, so two days notice, um, or until they find another person to take occupancy of the room, whichever is the lesser of the two. Um, and then this is how you basically calculate your lease breaking fees. So basically a two-step process, um, but you, if you're trying to figure out how much rent you owe left, um, it's the monthly amount of rent times by 12 months divided by 365 days per year. That's how you get your dollar amount per day. Using that into the second part of the formula, you get that, you input that amount per day here, times that by the amount of days it took to find a new resident, or if it's um, if they don't find a resident until the end of the fixed term period, that equals your lease breaking fees. Um, that's one component of it. If you need to pay reletting and advertising, you use that same formula, but for the cost of the reletting and advertising. Always ask for the invoice from the rental provider or the real estate agent, because if they didn't actually pay that fee and they can't prove they paid that fee, then they're not out of pocket. So they can't claim that amount from you. And again, they can ask this of you, but to make it legally binding and compel you to pay them for lease breaking fees or compensation, they need to get an order at VCAT. They need to start a VCAT application for compensation. They need to present the evidence as to why the amount they're getting, they're asking for is reasonable. Um, and then they need to prove that it's reasonable. So then um, until it gets to that point and there's an order, um, what they're asking for is just what they're asking for. If you choose to pay it for the sake of trying to, you know, um, reduce your headache and just leave the property, that's completely up to you. But for it to be legally binding and for them to be able to pursue you with the force of the law, they need to go through the VCAP process. Um, and then the last bit is bonds. So almost there. Basically, some of the common problems um, we see when people are trying to end their lease is the bond return component of things. So this is, again, the very last stage of the process. 
Um, and this is where rental providers might say, oh, you owe me compensation, or oh, you owe me rental, um, rental arrears, so I'm not going to pay you back your bond. Well, technically, as a first off, um, the bond needs to be lodged with the RTBA, and so the Residential Tenancies Bond Authority, and if it's not, that's an offence, um, and the bond can only be released once the tenancy has ended. So once you've left, return the keys, all that jazz, um, then there's a couple of ways in which you can um, try to get your money back. And so with the bond return process, at any point in the three different circumstances I'm about to go through, there's always the option to negotiate and there's always the option to start a VCAT claim. You don't have to specifically use one of these three circumstances. If you want to go straight to a VCAT claim, that's fine. If you want to negotiate and not go through any of these processes, that's also fine. But basically the three ways in which you can get your money back. Um, so the first circumstance is that all parties agree. Rental provider um, and the renter or the, the resident and the rooming house operator all agree, that's fine, let's get the money released. All you need to do is um, apply to the RTBA for either all of the money to be released or partial amount of the money to be released. So if you know there's been damage at the property and you're happy to compensate for it because you've negotiated it, um, then you can say, okay, Mr. RTBA, I want 50% um, of my bond back and we've agreed that 50% is going to go to the rental provider or the rooming house operator as compensation. That's perfectly fine. That's the first circumstance. The second circumstance is um, if the renter doesn't, if the renter consents to the bond to be returned to them, but the renter provider doesn't because something's being contested. So this is usually where there'll be an issue because the renter provider is trying to claim, um, you know, damages to the property or rental arrears or some other thing um, that they're asking for in compensation. So basically, what can happen here is, um, again, you can negotiate or two, you can um, ask, you can apply to the RTBA for a partial refund of the bond back. And then so if you apply for a partial or a full amount of your bond to be returned, the RTBA will notify all parties. So they'll let, um, so say for example, you're the person starting it as a renter. So they'll let the, um, the rental provider know that you've tried to start that claim to either ask for some or all of that money back. Within 14 days, if the rental provider or the rooming house operator, sorry, the rental provider or the rooming house operator doesn't apply to VCAT. So again, the onus is on them to start a VCAT app. If they don't do that within 14 days of you lodging this application at the RTBA, then the RTBA can do one of two things. So um, if it's if the application hasn't been lodged, then the RTBA can release your money and then you're on your way. If um, the rental provider does start a VCAT application, then basically you will need to go through that um, process. Once the um, VCAT order has been made by the member, then you can go back and use circumstance one to apply to get your money back. You'll need to provide the order number provided by the member. The third way that um, it, that might eventuate from trying to get your bond back is if the renter provider consents, but you don't consent as a renter. So as a, as a, rent, a rental provider can only apply for the RTBA to have all the money returned to you. They can't apply to the RTBA to say, oh, I want 50% of the money. That's not how it works. They need to go through the VCAP process if they want money to go to them. If they want money to go to you, that's fine. They'll apply to the RTBA. RTBA will turn the money to you. Um, if the rental provider and the renter can negotiate a sum because, you know, the rental provider is asking for money, that's another way that this can go. Or the third way is the rental provider or the renter can apply to VCAT. So usually with bond return issues will fall within one of these three sections. Um, so basically, it's, it's, oops, sorry, I'm just looking at another question here. Oops, sorry, I forgot to read the messages as I was going on. Um, but basically, that brings us to the end of the slides. I see we've got a few questions here. Um, so I'll try to answer them to the best that I can. 